<laughs> okay, it's a pleasure for me to present the, the conference of Dr. Dr. Estela Paz Artal. Uh, Dr. Uh, Paz Artal is a medical doctor specialized in immunology and the 12 de octubre hospital where she is now the head of the department. She is also professor at the Complutense University of Madrid, uh, professor of immunology and also the uh, PI of the research group in the institute of the same hospital 12 of October. Uh, in immunodeficiencies and transplantation. Dr. Pazartal has published more than 100 scientific uh, international papers and in the last years she has been very much involved in COVID where she has published already more than 30 papers. So it is a pleasure for us to introduce you her and to listen all the work she has done in this uh, new virus that has been keeping us busy for the last two or three years. Thank you very much, Estela, and welcome to Barcelona. Thank you, Eva, for your nice presentation, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. I am really, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here and uh, sharing with you this, this wonderful meeting. So, um, I think that uh, we all uh, agree that COVID-19 has been a global disaster. It has nowadays more than 600 million of infected people, more than 6 million of uh, deaths. So, but it has also been an opportunity to go again through uh, classical lessons in antiviral immunity. And uh, for us as uh, immunologists, and in particular of uh, hospital immunologists, it, it has taken from us the commitment to contribute somehow with uh, smaller or bigger works, trying to alleviate uh, the situation. So in the next slides, I'm gonna uh, try to summarize to you uh, some of the work that we have done uh, during COVID-19 in the hospital. And we first uh, focus on, in a, uh, on innate immunity during uh, acute infection, because um, the, the uh, news that we were receiving at the uh, beginning of the pandemic from China and from Italy told us that in, in particular in the most severe cases, this, uh, the, the, um, these severe cases were um, 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 I mean, distinguish or, or, or characterize by a hyperinflammation in where probably monocytes and macrophages were playing a very uh, um, prominent role. So we ask if the early analysis of peripheral blood monocytes could provide some information on the evolution and on the outcome of COVID-19. And to try to answer that question, we, we um, uh, recruited uh, 131 patients who were suffering acute COVID-19 at that moment and um, we recruited them in the emergency room arrival before taking any drug, before receiving any treatment. And we also recruited 62 COVID-19 patients that, that had already passed uh, COVID-19 six months ago and 45 healthy controls for comparisons. So we focus, as I said, in the, to, to analyze the, 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 the circulating monocytes in peripheral blood, and we establish here the three mon most important uh, uh, groups of uh, circulating monocytes, the, the classical, intermediate, and non-classical ones. And as you can see here, the proportion of these uh, monocytes were um, altered in uh, uh, acute COVID-19 patients with um, um, non-classical monocytes virtually disappear in these patients, while the most uh, uh, monocytes were either classical or intermediate, so inflammatory monocytes. And I can show you here how many of the um, uh, surface markers that characterize the monocytes were very altered also in these patients, and in particular we noticed that in acute COVID-19 monocytes there uh, was uh, a, a, a striking down regulation of the expression of HLADR in the surface of the monocytes. Then we separated these monocytes from peripheral blood from the three cohorts, 
and we put them in a, in a plate with LPS for 24 hours, and we observe here that those monocytes coming from acute COVID-19 patients were the ones producing more IL-6, TNF-alpha, IL-8, etc. In, in, in general, uh, inflammatory cytokines. So up to this moment, we could conclude that uh, in acute COVID-19 patients, circulating monocytes were mostly classical monocytes, inflammatory monocytes with a low HLADR expression, so a low capacity to present antigens to T cells, and an increased capacity to secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines, whereas in those patients who had already overcome the disease, uh, the circulating monocytes have returned to normal proportions, they show normal um, um, functional state, and they have also recovered the expression of those uh, markers in the surface. We also measure other parameters in these patients. For example, we measure the amount of uh, 20 uh, cytokines in serum, and also we measure the uh, capacity to mount the cellular specific immune response against uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, using peptides coming from the spike the nucleocapside or the membrane and establishing this uh, fluorospot study uh, and enumerating the number of spots producing uh, either interferon gamma or IL-2 after the stimulation with the peptides. And what we observe here is that the, in, in acute COVID-19 patients, the patients who were suffering acute COVID-19 at that moment and before receiving any treatment, there was this uh, uh, down regulation of HLADR. Uh, in circulating monocytes that uh, correlated with a pro-inflammatory cytokine environment and a limited uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS specific T cell response. Whereas in those patients that have or already been recovered from the uh, disease, there was a normalization of pro-inflammatory cytokines in SERA, which was concomitant with an augmentation of HLADR expression in monocytes and a better capacity to mount this uh, antiviral cellular response. We wanted to go a little bit deeper in, in understanding the genomics of these uh, monocytes, and for that we uh, uh, did a transcriptomic uh, analysis in separated monocytes from the three um, um, cohorts of, 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 of patients. And we observed that, for example, in acute COVID-19 patients, there was this, these monocytes had a significantly upregulation of, uh, of genes such as IL-10, amphiregulin, BCL-6, etc. And in, 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 in overall, uh, many of most of these genes uh, belong to a transcriptomic program of inflammation resolution and tissue repairing. And we also observed uh, that uh, some of these genes that were upregulated in acute COVID-19 uh, remain uh, still upregulated in uh, um, patients that have already passed the disease six months ago. For example, here you can see amphiregulin, amphiregulin or IL-10 are also here. And so this signature was still visible in post-COVID-19 uh, monocytes. And we observe also among the downregulated genes in acute COVID-19, there is, for example, HLADR was, was already what was already uh, downregulating in, according to the flow cytometry that, uh, data that we have obtained before. Then we wanted also to see if uh, COVID-19 could uh, have some epigenetic consequence on the monocytes. So for that, we made a study called ATAC-SEC that probably you know much better than me that what that is. But uh, so that is... Um, an analysis that gives you an idea on, on, of how many open sites are there in the chromatin of the, of the cell. So it gives you an idea of uh, uh, how many promoters are active on the genome and <clears throat> the, on the overall uh, uh, transcriptional activity of the cell. So here I show you, for example, that acute COVID monocytes were the ones with a higher number or the highest number of open, uh, uh, open sites in the chromatin. The, healthy co the monocytes from healthy control show the lower number and uh, post-COVID-19 uh, post, uh, monocytes have an intermediate number of open sites in chromatin. And when we went a little bit gene by gene, we observed that many uh, of these genes show a profile that was uh, consistent with the data that we have obtained in, in, in transcriptome. 
So, in conclusion of this part, open chromatin profiling monocytes was higher in acute COVID-19 patients, and some changes in the chromatin accessibility pattern were still there in post-COVID-19 monocytes. Here, I show you the principal component analysis of the three groups of, of patients. Uh, again, according to the phenotype of monocytes in circulation, according to the level of cytokines in circulation, and according to the transcriptome of monocytes. And as you can be see here, in, in general, uh, healthy controls and post-acute COVID-19 patients are more overlapping here and here, while those uh, data from acute COVID-19 patients are the less overlapping ones, which makes more, which makes sense. But here we notice that this cloud coming from the dots of um, uh, um, uh, acute COVID-19 patients, according to the, monos, uh, to the phenotype of the monocytes in circulation, was enlarged okay, uh, along this axis, probably meaning that um, uh, the, those monocytes in circulation would be quite different from one, one patient to the other. So we did another analysis. In this case, we perform this unsupervised analysis and ask the, the patients, let's say, to self-classify according to the level of expression of the markers in the surface of their monocytes. So according to this analysis, the, uh, this acute COVID-19 patients, they self-classify into two groups that we call cluster A and cluster B. Cluster A patients have monocytes with low levels of markers in the surface of the monocytes, whereas uh, cluster B patients have high levels of these markers in the surface of their monocytes. So I show you here an example of, of the thing that I just explained, and then we also observe that classical monocytes, inflammatory uh, monocytes were more important here in cluster A patients, and also we notice that uh, the rate of patients that needed to be admitted into um, um, intensive care unit were, uh, was, was higher in cluster A than in cluster B. And the rate of patients that uh, died during the disease was also higher in cluster A and cluster, than in cluster B. So, in summary, According to circulating monocyte phenotype at ER arrival, acute COVID-19 patients self-classify into these two groups with different needs for uh, being admitted in, in intensive care unit or uh, uh, exitus. Not only these patients from cluster A died early, died, they died more, they died earlier, but when we analyze the, 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 uh, the amount of, or the, the magnitude of the cellular response against SARS-CoV-2 SARS using that um, um, fluorospot spot uh, analysis, we also observed that uh, cluster A patients were less powerful in doing that cellular response than cluster B patients. Then we also had the opportunity to, to test the samples of these patients one more time uh, along the evolution of the disease. And uh, we compare here uh, patients who finally remain alive after the disease and patients who finally died after the disease, irrespectively of being from cluster A or cluster B. And we um, 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 analyze the, the upregulation of those markers in the surface of the monocytes. I show you here just the uh, evolution of HLADR um, expression in the monocytes because that, that was the most, uh, let's say, outstricking uh, data. Uh, so, as you can be, uh, as you can see here, patients that finally remain alive show an upregulation, of, an increase of expression of HLA-DR in monocytes, whereas patients who died uh, show a, 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 a decreased expression of HLA-DR in monocytes. And I show you here one example of each one of these patients. So, this is, was a, a patient who finally survive and you can see here how along the disease they are able to mount the cellular immune response, the specific cellular immune response against the virus and this goes uh, together with a, 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 an, um, an increasing expression of HLA-DR in monocytes whereas a patient that finally dies uh, is unable to mount this cellular response, is unable to produce the, the, the T cells, do not produce interferon gamma or IL-2 after a stimulation with uh, SARS-CoV-2 peptides and the um, 
expression of HLA-DR uh, decreases uh, um, along the disease. We analyzed the transcriptome of these monocytes coming from cluster A or cluster B patients, and we observed that they, that they were different just in the expression of one gene. This gene was, um, um, this gene was uh, IRF1 gene, which belongs to the type 1 interferon uh, program. So uh, just to sum up uh, all this study, um, we think we uh, identified a, a cluster of patients who have more inflammatory monocytes with than regulated type 1 interferon program, a low capacity to, uh, to present antigens, less uh, specific cellular response, and a higher risk for uh, intensive care unit or death. So probably measuring HLADR expression in monocytes at ER arrival and before the administration of any drug could be a good biomarker for predicting severity. These uh, data were obtained by Alberto, who is now a postdoc in Mount Sinai in, in New York and was published uh, uh, in the past already. And then we moved to, to analyze the adaptive immunity during the acute infection. So for, uh, for, um, to study that, we um, recruited several cohorts of patients uh, starting but uh, a, a, a very, a quite a big cohort of recovered patients, patients who have already passed COVID-19 four to seven months ago. And uh, then uh, other, we recruited also other patients who were suffering COVID-19 in that moment, uh, just when they were arri arriving in the emergency room. And we were able to make this longitudinal and prospective analysis, taking several samples along the time of evolution of the disease. And then according to the uh, course of the evolution of the disease, we classified these patients into mild COVID-19 patients, moderate or severe. And I show you first the data that we obtained here in patients that had already passed the disease. We were able to uh, find uh, um, a nice uh, cellular response uh, seven months after, uh, after overcoming the disease and also antibodies, although the antibodies, as it has been repeatedly said, uh, they were a little bit decreasing already. And then uh, with this data, we obtained the cutoff to establish what patients could be positive or negative for a cellular immune response. And we applied that cutoff for the study of these three cohorts in patients that were suffering the acute disease at that moment. And then I show you here the um, cellular immune response, the humoral immune response along the day of the days of evolution. So this means days for symptom onset. The light color represents the acute phase of the disease. The dark color represents the convalescent, the later phase of the disease. And as you can see here, in my COVID-19 patients, we were able to detect a cellular response very early during the disease. And um, this uh, cellular response peak at day 15, uh, after the, uh, um, the onset of the symptoms, we detected also a nice uh, humoral response with a good neutralizing capacity, and there was an, a good um, a correlation between the amounts of antibodies and the neutralizing capacity. In moderate COVID-19 patients, the cellular response was not so early, okay, it was less difficult to detect it in the, at the beginning of the disease, during the acute phase of the disease, but still at the covalescent phase of the disease, it boosted, okay, it was quite potent. These patients with moderate COVID-19 made a lot of antibodies with a strong uh, neutralizing capacity, and there was a good correlation between number of antibodies, amount of antibodies, and neutralizing capacity. But what happened? in severe COVID-19 patients. Okay, so in these patients, we were not able to detect virtually any cellular response along the course of the disease. The patients, some patients made antibodies, but this production of antibodies was quite uneven, irregular. In those patients, those patients who made antibodies show also a good, good neutralizing capacity with good correlations between antibodies and neutralization. And then here we compared uh, patients that finally died versus that, uh, patients that finally survived. And as you can see here, those patients that finally died were the ones not doing any cellular response or any antibodies at all. So in summary, in severe COVID-19 patients, there is a late 
weak cellular response. There is a cellular humoral discoordinated response. The, uh, the, 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 the dominant response is mostly humoral, and the exitus was associated with absence of both uh, responses. Not only mild COVID um, patients uh, uh, show a faster cellular response, but the cellular response involved also a higher number of T cell clones, uh, because here the, the, the green bars are taller, okay? And these T cell clones were more functional because they, each one of them produced more interferon gamma or more IL-2 after uh, stimulation with the SARS-CoV-2 peptides. Another observation in this, uh, in this work were that patients with a stronger specific T cell response were those with higher CT values, with higher vi viral loads values at emergency room arrival. So meaning probably that this uh, specific T cell response was able to control viral replication, okay? And finally, we also made some statistical analysis and we found that independently of age and sex, which you, as you know, that, uh, they are very important contributions for the severity in this, in this disease, the uh, S1 specific cellular response measured at emergency room arrival emerged as a protective factor for severity with an odd ratio of 0.47. So this is like a summary of all the uh, parameters from the cellular and the humoral immune response that we measure in these patients. These are called correlograms or something like that. Uh, so this represents all the correlation between these parameters, two by two, in, uh, in the acute phase of the disease, and these are the, uh, in the convalescent phase of the disease. So as you can observe here in mild patients, there is a nice correlation between all parameters from both arms of Im the immune response, cellular and humoral, early in the acute phase of the disease. This is not found in convalescent patients, in, sorry, in moderate uh, COVID-19 patients, but still these moderate patients um, sucks success in doing this uh, coordinated response later in the disease, while the severe patients does not make any um, coordinated response either in the acute or the um, uh, final phase of the disease. So the early and coordinated development of cellular and humoral response is probably key to prevent severity. These uh, data uh, were um, um, uh, obtained by, by, by Patricia and published in PLOS Pathogens last year. And then we moved to study the adaptive immune response uh, in, to vaccination. Uh, vaccines in Madrid were, um, um, were distributed in the same week as the Philomena snowstorm. It causes a, quite a messy situation. This is, was our, our, our hospital and how it looked like with Esther Mancebo, a colleague in, in, immunology, in the immunology department of the hospital that uh, some of you uh, know. But still, we managed to, to implement this study. We recruited 77 uh, healthcare workers who were going to receive the vaccines, okay? And we have studied them along one year of, of um, observation in a prospective and longitudinal way, again. Uh, and along this time, they have received the three doses of mRNA vaccines. And then um, we have taken blood samples um, at different time points in which we have studied uh, cellular response and humoral response. 17 of these healthcare workers have already passed the disease in, during the first wave, so we call them recover subjects, and uh, 60 um, had not passed the disease, so we call them naive subjects. So here, I show you the evolution of the cellular response and the humoral response and neutralizing capacity of the antibodies along the one year of, um, of observation. And in general, we could say that uh, we uh, observe a higher cellular and humoral responses in recovery subjects. Uh, and that, that the third dose of, of vaccination here mostly boosted the T cell response in recovered subjects and mostly boosted the humoral response in uh, naive subjects. 
Then we uh, observe also that uh, along this uh, year of observation, no recovered patient, no patient that have already passed the infection had it again. So no breakthroughs infect, uh, breakthrough infection happened in these recovered patients. These breakthrough infections were only observed among naive subjects. Five of them after receiving the two first doses of vaccination and 12 more after receiving the third dose of vaccination. And then, so when we studied the cellular immunity here in, in these patients, we observed that this, uh, that each dose of vaccination improved the cellular response against uh, um, S1 pep uh, peptides because of course that that was the antigen in the in the vaccine but we couldn't find any response against m and n further confirming that these were true naive patients okay and then in these patients we could observe that how in uh, the cellular response as well as the humoral response improved or uh, was boosted after passing the uh, the, the the infection uh, after receiving two doses of vaccination of a, after receiving the three doses of, vaccine, of vaccination. Another observation in this work was that um, in these uh, um, recovered patients, we could still, ob uh, still observe a nice cellular response against uh, uh, M-peptides and N-peptides. So in pept uh, after stimulation with peptides uh, uh, coming from the, the other regions different from the vaccination, so memory cell, res cell, uh, cell responses were detected in recovered subjects 22 months after uh, overcoming the natural infection. Then at the end of this study, we wanted maybe to ask if there could be any correlation between cellular and humoral responses after vaccination and protection from future infections, from uh, breakthrough infections. So for that, we map all the values obtained at peak levels at day 15 after two vaccinations in our patients. So this is graph, uh, a graph representing the neutralizing capacity, the cellular uh, re response capacity, and uh, we put these crosses uh, representing the values of the patients with uh, breakthrough infections. So uh, we then uh, classified all this cloud of, 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 of dots into four groups according to the average levels of, uh, of uh, cellular responses and the average levels of the neutralizing uh, um, uh, um, titers. And we obtained these, group, these four groups of patients. And we observed that those with breakthrough um, infections just belong to um, this group with high neutralizing capacity but low cellular response to this group of high cellular response by low neutralizing capacity or to this group with both low parameters, but no crosses, no breakthrough infections were detected in this group. So we speculated that maybe these values were indicating those patients that were, could, could be free from breakthrough infections after receiving the two first doses of vaccination, of course. And then we also conclude of course, that naive subjects with the cell and or the neutralizing values lower than average at day 15 after receiving the two doses of vaccination would be the ones benefiting the most from a third dose. Of course, this is an, a small work that should be extensively uh, validated in, in, in bigger cohorts. And uh, yeah, the, these are the data from uh, Patricia also. And then we also studied the response against vaccination in some, not only in immune competent patients, but also in, in some cohorts of uh, immune compromised patients. For example, here I show you a very few slides concerning the, um, the uh, immune response to vaccination in, in common variable immune deficient patients. And as it has been said before, these patients have low or undetectable uh, uh, numbers levels of immunoglobulin. Uh, in, in Sera, and most of them suffer infections, okay? So these patients suffering um, with CV, uh, ID, uh, suffering um, in only infections, um, we observe that they have a, a, a low rate of, of uh, humoral response when, when they compare with the rates of uh, seroconversion in healthy controls, and also lower rates of cellular response towards the, the vaccine. And these lower rates were even more marked in those CVID patients with a T uh, 
dysregulation components. So those patients suffering, um, for example, autoimmune uh, diseases or infoproliferative diseases on top of infections, okay? So in, in short, we observe a lower rate of responding subjects among these uh, CVID patients when compared uh, to, to healthy controls, the, 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 these responses were also slower and they had a lower magnitude, okay? So this is just to, to illustrate that, that it was uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Immunology. And then we finally had also the opportunity to study small groups of long COVID uh, um, condition. As you know, this long COVID condition is a pathology that is defined by the uh, World Health Organization by the um, uh, remaining symptoms uh, at least three months after having passed the acute COVID-19 uh, disease and remaining for more than uh, two months, okay? So here, by studying this condition, we try to ask these two questions first. Is long COVID uh, or are long COVID symptoms linked to any type of immunological disturbance? And then can long COVID uh, be prevented or even cured with drugs targeting innate immunity? So we here recruited um, five patients who have already passed the disease with no persistent symptoms at all. Then nine patients that had passed the disease and had persistent symptoms in orange. And then we treated these patients with a short course of prednisone, 30 milligrams of prednisone per day during four days. And then we measure the same parameters as here. We measure uh, um, them again in these patients after taking the prednisone. So we um, made an extensive panel of um, in, in immune parameters thanks to spectral flow cytometry, and we obtain this principal component uh, analysis based on these 46 uh, parameters. And as you can observe here, these parameters were able to distinguish all the three situations, all the three cohorts of patients. And as you can see here, these are the patients who had no symptoms at all, patients who had persistent symptoms. And you can see here how these patients, after taking the prednisone, goes or come a little bit closer to patients with no symptoms at all, okay? Another representation of this classification was obtained by this unsupervised hierarchical clustering analysis that currently classified, again, the patients. So here we have the patients who had no symptoms at all, patients with persistent symptoms, among which the most prominent ones were altralgia, myalgia, uh, dyspnea, or, or headache, and then in the middle, you can see the same patients as here after taking the prednisone. As you can see here in, in these light colors, how in many cases, those symptoms uh, improve a lot of uh, disappear. I show you here a little more in detail some of the data that we obtain in the, in the measuring of those in, immune parameters. For example, in the innate immunity uh, compartment, we observe that those patients with persistent symptoms have higher number of, um, uh, of a classical dendritic cell, of NKT cells, lower numbers of plasmos plasmocytoid dendritic cells. And um, you can see here how after taking the prednisone, these values go back to be more similar to the ones observed in, pa in patients with no persistent symptoms, okay? Then um, uh, three groups of monocytes were also quite disturbed. The uh, monocytes coming from these patients with persistent symptoms were the ones with um, more capacity to produce inflammatory cytokines. Then uh, regarding the adaptive compartment, for example, we observed that those patients with the long COVID uh, condition had low numbers of naive, naive uh, CD4 and naive uh, CD8 T cells a high number of memory uh, CD4 T cells, have a high number of TEMRA cells, and low number of uh, T follicular helper cells. And you can see how these numbers uh, came back to normal values after taking the prednisone. And then in these uh, patients, we could also measure the same, many of these uh, parameters uh, four months after taking the prednisone. This is represented by the uh, pink bars. And you can see here how many of these parameters remain stable along the four months after taking the prednisone. Uh, T-cells from uh, uh, patients with uh, persistent symptoms have 
uh, more um, expression of activation markers such as CD38 or or HLADR, and more expression of exhaustion markers such as FAS or PD-1, and those markers came back to normal situation after taking the prednisone. And then we also said that among the TH uh, population of uh, lymphocytes, the most predominant one was a TH1 response, and the same uh, was true for the T follicular helper cells. And finally, T rate was also uh, were also low uh, in in patients with persistent symptoms, and they uh, came back to normal values after taking the prednisone, and remain stable for months four months after the prednisone treatment. This was also published last year by Alberto. And um, so this is my, let's say, um, uh, sum, uh, to sum up uh, the, the, all those de data, I think we uh, demonstrated that a good phenotype and function of circulating monotypes was a, a, a marker of a, 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 a disease with a less a severe course with a, a better infection resolution. Uh, for the infection res uh, uh, resolution was also very important to have a coordinated, a balanced a cellular as well as humoral immune response. And probably the same was also important after receiving the vaccination to protect uh, against breakthrough infections. And regarding the long COVID-19 uh, condition, I have shown you how uh, these patients seem to have a very dysregulated immunity that could be probably um, improved by taking drugs such as uh, prednisone and we are now involved in a clinical trial to to demonstrate better uh, with a better design this pilot study this is a clinical trial with four arms in which we are examining the the capacity of prednisone and colchicine and, and colchicine and also with two uh, placebo arms so uh, this is the history of humankind, okay? This is the history of pandemics. COVID-19 is here, so this probably will not be the, the last one. So it's very necessary to learn lessons, immunology lessons in our case, to be better prepared for the next pandemic. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk uh, questions, uh, Dr. Puyol. Estela? Hello? Sí. Estela, congratulations for a very nice presentation and also because Thank behind you. that there must be a very good organization and the data are very interesting. Just two short questions. One is regarding the the, macro, the monocytes that were more um, associated to a poor prognosis. Um, could, did you check for how much of that could be accounted by age and by the presence of interf anti interferon antibodies? By age and by the presence of? Anti interferon type okay. 1. Interferon alpha and omega antibodies. Antibod no, in, in that cohort, um, uh, we didn't uh, check for those antibodies that have been uh, uh, demonstrated to be so important in, in those severe cases, uh, antibodies against the inter uh, type uh, 1 interferon, right? And um, regarding the age, um, mm, 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 there was no relationship between age or, or sex, because you know that uh, males have also a, a, a worse course of the of the disease. So in in, in this um, study analyzing the monocytes, there, there were no intervention of either sex or or or, or, or age in those monocyte disturbances that was that, that they were saying that those patients are going to have a worse course of the disease. No, no, no relationship. Uh, I agree with Dr. Pujol that the, the presentation was really very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Stella. Thanks. And I have two questions. One, um, maybe is you have already asked to the question, you answered this by the question of Dr. Pujol, but um, about the cluster A and cluster B, there was a, an any correlation with age or gender? No. Okay. Uh, the other question that I had is um, about the um, 
the DR expression. So this is something only observed on monocytes, uh, or also you have already seen B cells or T cells, which also express DR that is down regulated. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell. <laughs> we focus on the expression of HLADR in monocytes um, um, under the rationale that it's an important molecule for antigen presentation and monocytes are the precursors of macrophages and that it's, uh, they are one of the most important antigen presenting cells. So, but it would be interesting, of course, yeah. uh, to see if because there is also a down regulation of this expression. This could be affecting the humoral mm -hmm. Uh, the, the production of antibodies. Yes. And uh, regarding this, uh, the dam regulation of uh, class two, I was wondering if uh, one of the affected genes by uh, epigenetic uh, modification could be C2TA, which is a transactivator of uh, class two molecules. We have to check that <laughs> again. We will uh, went back to those data to see if that's true. I've, uh, um, we, for example, uh, apart from that um, um, re regulation of inflammation um, program that we obtain and tissue repairing program, we also obtain a program that is related with the um, um, senescent uh, an anti senescent secretion uh, program. So many of the data that we obtained in that uh, transcriptomic essay uh, was related with that program also. Uh, but uh, in that particular case, I have to check. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, my question is about the severe COVID infection regarding uh, macrophages. So we know that virus usually downregulate MHC class one in order to avoid recognition by T cell, cytotoxic T cell. So my question is, what is the mechanism that involved in induction of missing HLA-DR? I mean, is, is there like a certain signals from the microenvironment or specific molecule that is responsible for uh, missing HLA-DR? I am not sure if I understood your question. I'm sorry, but no. He wants to know which is it. the mechanism of the downmodulation of uh, of uh, class, class two in the monocytes. Yeah, exactly. The mechanism. Okay, we didn't really uh, design our study to 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 check for mechanisms, you know. So I am I'm afraid that I not answer very well that question. Mm -hmm. But it was just an observation coming from big cohorts of patients and. For sure, it's very, very interesting that I am quite sure that others have already done a little bit more to explore the, the mechanisms in, in, in uh, models, in animal models and all that. And uh -huh. it would be interesting also to check, for sure. And in okay. following his question, where are the markers like PCR or uh, IL-6 uh, levels or other ferritin or other markers that correlate with this uh, down modulation? of the air in monocytes? Okay, so um, in, in, in um, of course, in uh, regarding the levels of uh, inflammatory cytokines in, in, in circulation, IL-6 were, were, uh, was totally uh, related with this uh, down regulation of HLA-DR. Uh, um, for example, also these patients were very uh, lymphopenic and they show also higher rates of LDA, of some liver enzymes. So in general, all those parameters that have been defined as markers in the severe, in the severe forms of the disease were very well related with this, this HLADR down regulation. And the, the, that the paper has a lot of, of uh, um, supplemental information that you can check, so yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, regarding the adaptive uh, immunity part, you show uh, that fascinating uh, point uh, graphs that the mild patients had a paired uh, humoral cellular response during the acute phase, and the moderate patients uh, didn't have it in the acute phase, but 
after the acute phase, they, yeah. do you have the, the possibility to follow that patients if are reinfections, they travel to the mild group patients? If I, so, so, so the question is so if, if I have the opportunity to follow up the patients? Yeah, so if this, uh, after the acute phase, mm -hmm. paired cellular humoral response achieved, let's say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is conserved in a, in a new reinfection. In a new reinfection. Yeah, after this one, no, if I'm, you have the possibility to follow no, up. No, I'm afraid that we didn't follow up the, the, those patients so, for, for so long times. No, no. No, but I mean, almost every, uh, every question that you could ask about this new disease is so important and so, so interesting to answer. Yeah, we could keep on uh, analyzing some of these patients, and, uh, but still, yeah, that could be very nice. Uh, a very nice question. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Thank you Thanks. all of you for all the questions. And now we have one break for lunch. But before I want to give you... <laughs>